Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Charles Stang, and I'm the director of the Center for the Study of World Religions here at Harvard Divinity School. Welcome to our first faculty book event of the year on my colleague Giovanni Bazzano's latest book, Having the Spirit of Christ, Spirit, Possession, and Exorcism in the Early Christ Groups, which appeared um, in Yale University Press's Syncresis series. This series of faculty book events was established by my predecessor at the center, Frank Clooney, as an opportunity for the Divinity School community to gather not only to celebrate faculty publications, but more importantly, to learn from them by engaging with them both appreciatively and critically. And to that end, we're very grateful for our two respondents whose comments will kick off what I hope will be a very spirited conversation. So thank you all for registering in advance for this seminar. When we last checked, we had over 100 people registered. We have only an hour together, so I'm going to keep my remarks very brief in hopes that there will be time for Q&A. We're expecting that this event will spill over the two o'clock uh, hour. So uh, uh, we're anticipating taking questions uh, after that. Uh, so let me introduce our author and two respondents. Uh, Giovanni Bazzana is professor of New Testament here at Harvard Divinity School. His research and teaching focus chiefly on the critical study of the early Christ movement and of early Christianity in the context of Second Temple Judaism and more broadly within ancient Mediterranean history, religion, and material culture. William Arnell is a professor of religious studies in the Department of Gender, Religion, and Critical Studies at the University of Regina. His work focuses on early Christianity, theories of religion, and the politics of religious studies. Angela Kim Harkins writes on the topic of prayer in antiquity and the lived experience of religion. She is an associate professor of New Testament at Boston College's School of Theology and Ministry and a former Marie Curie International Incoming Fellow at the University of Birmingham in England during which time she conducted research on the Dead Sea Scrolls and religious experience. So here's how this event will unfold. Giovanni will first say a few words about his book. Then Bill and Angela will offer their remarks. We'll then give Giovanni a chance to respond and then open up the discussion for your questions and comments. So without further ado, thank you again for joining us. And I would like to uh, invite Giovanni to join us and get this conversation started. Thanks for uh, this, for being here to this presentation of, on my book. I'm Giovanni Bozzana. Uh, I wanna start by saying thanks to Charles Stang for this invitation to present and talk about my book. Uh, this is not, this is a, a festive and a nice circumstance to have, you know, respondent, uh, smart people, uh, working and thinking about what I've written. So I wanna also thank Bill and Angela for being willing to do this uh, at a time where everyone is very busy, of course, as we all know. And uh, also thank the center and the staff of the center for making this possible at a time in which we are, you know, it's so difficult to connect with each other intellectually and not only intellectually. Um, what I wanna do uh, as an introduction is just to, since I, do not expect all of you to have read the book, to just say a few words about the conception, how this book came to be, and the contents, kind of summarizing them uh, very briefly, because I'm eager to see what Bill and Angela have to say about this. Uh, so this is a book that, as the subtitle says, deals with the themes of spirit possession and exorcism in, within the very early Christ groups. Um, this, is a, this is an important theme and, and a theme on which I've always struggled to find a good handle as a New Testament scholar. Um, I think that, you know, you can see that what spurred me to write on this was the observation that, you know, if you read the Gospels, for instance, uh, and, and you read, uh, read them throughout, you see that spirit possession and exorcism was very big theme, continuously discussed and it come up in a lot of uh, stories connected to the historical Jesus. And uh, though that being said, you know, if you read books, modern books, critical books, uh, some of the best books written on the topic of the historical Jesus, for instance, you see at the same time that this 
themes, spirit possession, exorcism, do not play almost any role. They are marginalized by scholarship. Um, and I think this is because it's very difficult to make sense of them with the tools of our contemporary biblical and historical criticism. Uh, so I, I, I struggled for a long time with this, with this issue and to find a good way to approach it. And I have to say, uh, uh, my wife, Giovanna Parmigiani, is an anthropologist and she kept telling me for many years, you know, you should read what anthropologists have written on this topic on spirit possession. Uh, and I never listened uh, well, to this wise advice. And finally, you know, when I was searching for a new project a few years ago, I decided, you know, let's, let's try this. Let's, let's read. And I discovered that she, obviously she was right. But also this, this the, the, the ethnographic word, the ethnographic writing on possession is extremely rich, extremely diverse, theoretically sophisticated, it simply it opened up to be an entire new world of appreciation of what possession, what spirit possession is. And in particular, it, it revealed to me really that you know, our, you know, the outlook that we have on this phenomenon built on the study of New Testament, our biblical texts, is very narrow. It does not uh, uh, grasp, uh, for instance, the positive side of spirit possession that, you, that ethnographers have seen in, in very, very many cultures and, and seen and documented very, very, very richly. So I, I try to, in, in the book, the book is built like this, an attempt to reread some of this uh, New Testament text that we all know very well uh, and that seem they're so familiar to, to us, uh, try to reread this uh, text in the light of what I could learn from ethnographies and anthropological writing on this topic. And this was, you know, very, very illuminating because, like I said, it I really made an effort to not, to, this is not the first, of course, I don't claim I'm the first one to use anthropological, ethnographic literature to read New Testament texts, even on this topic specifically, many others have done that before me. But what I try really consciously, deliberately to do is to actually let uh, the ethnographies lead uh, the reasoning, lead my approach to these texts and not the kind of biblical scholarship set the agenda in this in this regard, and like I said, you know, this this led me to discover a few interesting uh, elements uh, uh, with, with relationship to this text that I think end up giving a better, more adequate, more interesting even account of what's there. Um, so the book itself is divided into broad sections. Uh, one, uh, the first two chapters deal with stories. Uh, concerning Jesus, around the figure of Jesus. And uh, chapter one is an analysis, is built as an analysis of a famous, a famous and famously puzzling story of Jesus being accused of performing his exorcism in league with Beelzebul. And, you know, this, this, the, the, the answer that Jesus gives is, is famous. It's also famously, notoriously puzzling because he really doesn't deny that. The charge. He kind of affirms it in a certain sense. So this is the first chapter and the second chapter is more focused on another uh, s s famous episode uh, from the Gospels. This is the exorcism of the Gerasene demoniac in Mark 5 and other parallels. There's two parallels in Matthew and Luke. Famous story with the, the demon named Legion and it being sent into the herd of pigs uh, and so forth. Um, so the analysis of these two, uh, you know, very well-known episodes results in a defamiliarization. Like I said before, we are very familiar with this text, but, you know, by reading them through the lenses of ethnographies about possession, one gets to see, uh, one, one is defamiliarized. Uh, what, what we thought we know, or at least what I thought I knew about this text is, uh, as it has to be kind of changed radically. And, and one can see the positive work that is done in possession, through possession, you know, group formation, identity formation, the formation of a subjectivity of an exorcist in, in the case of Jesus. And uh, 
also you know, dealing with the past, dealing with politics in the case of the Mark V stories in particular, but dealing also with the mythical past, you know, in the identity, those, these impure spirits that Jesus is confronted with. Uh, so this is the first part of the book. The second part is three, three more chapters, which are more focused instead of the letters of the so-called letters of the authentic Paul. Um, and these are, these three chapters do not have a structure that follows like the first two kind of specific uh, pericopes or episodes. Uh, but uh, instead each chapter is devoted to a different theme that kind of runs through this group of letters. Uh, so the first chapter three is about Christology, you know, in, in a kind of old fashioned way. This is a revision of the Pauline, of Pauline Christology to affirm that for, for, for Paul, Jesus has become a spirit. It's something that he says explicitly in 1 Corinthians 15, after his death and resurrection, Jesus, Jesus the, the man, has become a spirit, has become the, the spirit that is called Christ and possesses individuals who are members of the, of the Christ group. And so that, that makes sense of the, this is my attempt to make sense of the famously, again, puzzling formula used by Paul, the en Christo, the en, in Christ formula that uh, Paul used so repeatedly. Chapter four continues along these lines in showing how this being, this life in Christ, uh, this life being possessed by Christ, makes sense, is, is, uh, how Paul makes sense of this life by restructuring his own self, you know, being subject to the possession of Christ and how that serves as, a, as an impulse, as a fundamental impulse to shape his ethical choices and also as, as a fundamental impulse to remembering, to make present this, you know, spirit of Christ in himself and in his groups. The last chapter of the book is about performance and performativity in possession. This is a, a very, very important topic in contemporary ethnographic writing on possession. Of course, uh, anthropologists and ethnographers realize very clearly that you know, possession is a performative act. It's something that is the result of a negotiation between an artist, as some, as some anthropologists say, and it's so and his or her audience. And so that, that can be studied, I think, very well also, again, with reference to the Pauline epistolary, and particularly 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, you know, which is one of the earliest and best description that we have from of this possession rituals within early Christ groups. So I think this is my time is over. Thank you very much for listening again, and I'll leave Bill and Angela. Uh, and I'm eager to see what they have to say. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here, and I appreciate the invitation. Uh, for me, the appeal of academia has been the prospect and the thrill of discovery, uncovering something new, understanding something difficult. The further down the rabbit hole of any one discipline, I'll ask, the rarer and rarer those eureka moments become. In the case of Christian origins, the falling rate of profit can be even worse than in other fields as so many scholars seem to approach the inquiry with answers already in hand. But the field continues to fascinate because every now and then a work will appear that is so interesting, productive, and provocative that it puts everything we knew or thought we knew in a different light. John Klopenberg's Formation of Q, Burton Mack's Myth of Innocence, and Karen King's What is Gnosticism were just such books for me. The most recent addition to that select company is Giovanni Bazzana's Having the Spirit of Christ. The central thesis of Giovanni's book is easily stated, that the surviving literary evidence of the Jesus movement testifies to the prominence of spirit possession as a core practice of those movements. Giovanni nowhere claims that possession is the skeleton key that will unlock every closed evidentiary door in the New Testament. Nonetheless, as he shows, it unlocks quite a few. This is a welcome departure from a body of scholarship that has expended considerable energy trying to insulate figures like Jesus and Paul from any trace of suspicious religiosity. More than this, however, 
the book mounts a serious argument about spirit possession itself and how we should understand it. Central here is the assertion, backed by a body of ethnographic data, that spirit possession and its related practices represent a productive intervention in social life. People use possession to shape subjectivity, to express agency, to embody an encounter past. Giovanni's approach recognizes that the world structure and views we modern or postmodern Westerners take for granted and have an unfortunate tendency to regard as universal and natural are not shared by all. As he notes, quote, most of the methodological moves performed in biblical studies rely on fundamental categories whose genealogy goes back to European intellectuals of the modern era, end quote. The alternative he proposes is to really listen to what the ancient writers claimed about themselves and, and I quote again, not fall prey to the temptation to treat as metaphors those elements of their religious experience that are foreign to our Western sensibilities, but instead to dare to take them literally. When we avoid the temptation to treat every peculiar statement in the New Testament as a complicated metaphor, the effect is powerfully defamiliarizing. It is defamiliarizing of texts whose liturgical and or scholarly familiarity breeds, if not contempt, then at least too easy identification. One of the many advantages of Giovanni's approach is how many problematic texts it illuminates and how many issues it so neatly solves. Take Paul's frequent and awkward use of en Christo, in Christ. We can now see it as a literal reference to the experience of subjectivity that Paul shares with Christ's spirit, which he understands himself to be within at the same time that it is within him. What about Paul's notorious thorn in the flesh, with sco which scholars have speculated refers uh, to anything from sexual desire on the one hand to epilepsy on the other? Again, why not take Paul literally and at his word? when he describes this thorn explicitly as an angel or messenger of Satan, and conclude that he is plagued by a demonic possession as well as more holy spirits. Occam's razor has seldom shaved so close. Or again, the baffling assertion Paul makes in Galatians 3.1 that his auditors have actually seen Jesus Christ publicly portrayed as crucified is rendered sensible when we recognize that spirit possession is a way of making the past tangible in the present. The Galatians really do actually witness the event of the crucifixion in as much as Paul literally embodies Christ. Although Giovanni himself doesn't explicitly raise it, another Gordian knot that can be cut with a well-placed blow of the sort of spirit possession is the matter of Paul's so-called conversion. The marked and apparently strife-ridden personal transformation that Paul associates with his turn to Christ can be read in much the same way that Giovanni reads the developing subjectivity of Jesus in his struggle with the Elzebul. And I'm referring to Jesus' struggle with the Elzebul and not Giovanni's, which is another matter of the other. Quite like Jesus, Paul is possessed by an alien other, an entity associated with the ecclesia Paul so vehemently opposed. Having been possessed by this alien other, like Jesus, Paul goes off into the desert and struggles to come to terms with the possessing agent. The integration of that agent into Paul's own subjectivity affects eventually a dramatic transformation, both of self-conception and of behavior. The anachronistic and by now surely discredited idea that Paul converted to a new religion can be replaced with a more contextually appropriate observation that he experienced and understood himself to have experienced a major personal transformation by virtue of integrating an alien personality, a spirit of otherness, Christ, into his own identity. Transformation of subjectivity raises a larger problem, that of social change generally. The tragically and recently deceased anthropologist David Graeber has explored some of the ways in which religion can play a central role in change, particularly in a breathtaking 2005 article on fetishism, a concept that has proved both fecund and confounding for the field of religious studies. Graeber critiques a tendency in the Marxist tradition to treat material production as a self-consciously creative act, but social production seemingly as if it unfolds of its own accord. 
Instead, Graeber suggests that people have always created new social forms in a fashion more or less similar to their creation of new physical objects. With a caveat that, as Marx suggests, we people have a tendency to misrecognize the products of our own creation as entities in themselves, invested with some mysterious force that demystified is actually our own creative labor. The nexus between the two types of creation is illustrated precisely for Graeber by the fetish. That is the actual West African physical manufactured creations that Portuguese merchants of the 15th century claimed were worshiped as gods. Graeber argues that these fetish objects were created as a way of representing new social realities, specifically new commercial relationships between Africans and Portuguese traders. They are literally new gods under construction, made by human work to express and endorse a new set of social relations brought about by new circumstances. It seems to me that we could argue something very similar in the case of spirit possession. How do people make something new? How do we negotiate transformations in personal and social identities? It is obvious enough that the Jesus movements were indeed engaged in efforts to do these very things. As Graeber suggests with West African fetishes, can we not sim uh, argue similarly for spirit possession as practiced in ancient Christianities? The possessing spirit is at once a mechanism for negotiating shifting identities and simultaneously the fabrication of a new and creative relationship with alterity, the latter itself, of course, whose intrusion animates social change. Thus, as with a fetish, a new object, more or less tangible, is created as an expression or objective manifestation of a new relationship or subjective identity. That new object then serves a mediating role among social actors whose positions are in the process of change or who desire to change them. If there really is a parallel here, then it suggests an enormously important role for the kinds of things we think of as religion in mediating and affecting social. Another feature of Giovanni's book that I think deserves some emphasis is how thoroughly and in what detail he situates the earliest writings about Jesus within a worldview that we might be tempted to describe as mythological, but which in fact forms the concrete and quotidian assumptions of people who saw themselves in perpetual interaction with semi-tangible supernatural forces. In this alien worldview, we encounter spirits that are palpable physical realities. We engage with heavenly beings of an angelic sort who represent a kind of overlap between the human and divine realms. We deal here too with the restless dead of Mediterranean antiquity. The ghosts of the unclean bastard Nephilim haunt the ethnic borderlands of the Decapolis. Perhaps most striking to me, Giovanni suggests that behind Paul's various statements about Jesus, the Christ, sons of God, and holy spirits, rests a relatively complicated Christology in which Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ, but by virtue of his obedient death, is resurrected, transformed into a spirit, and becomes unified with an already extant pre-existing spirit identity, described as the Son of God, distinct from the Christ. In a sense, there are three separate identities here, Jesus, the Christ, and Son of God. I would add in a nod to the Trinitarian re uh, resonances that Giovanni is so anxious to avoid that there are also here two natures, flesh and spirit. On this point, although Giovanni bases his reasoning mainly on Paul, especially the opening lines of Romans, and on the fifth similitude of the shepherd of Hermas, I think the Gospel of Mark could have provided just as much grist for his mill. Viewed through the powerful lens Giovanni has provided us, Mark tells the story of a more or less mortal man who at the moment of his baptism is possessed by a divine entity, a holy spirit from the sky, after which point the man is immediately identified by God himself with the son of God. That spirit in turn immediately drives him into the wilderness to struggle with demonic forces, that is, to engage in precisely the kind of conflictual, integrative work that a possession event initiates per Giovanni's analysis. Throughout the gospel, a variety of earthly and demonic forces recognize Jesus in terms elusive of the Davidic Messiah, 
but Jesus' own reaction to these identifications is ambivalent. In the meantime, spirit voices hail him again as son of God. This changes, however, once Jesus is crucified and died, more particularly gives up his spirit, whereupon his proleptic identity with the son of God is first recognized by a human figure. The spirit departs, Jesus dies, and in actions alluded to, but never directly described, he is resurrected and ascends to heaven. Whereupon, having integrated the spirit into his pre-mortem fleshy identity, he is now integrated by the spirit into its heavenly identity. Part of the reason I think this is an important point is that recent work on the Gospel of Mark has characterized it as a Paulinist writing a text composed as an articulation of the distinctively Pauline version of the gospel. If this is so, then the evidence that Mark has an unusual and complex view of Jesus, the spirit and the phenomenon of possession, would constitute important evidence in favor of Giovanni's reading of Paul. One last thing, which I raise with tremendous trepidation. I remind you all of Giovanni's injunction to dare to take literally our text descriptions. I also remind you of his assertion that it was Paul's possession by the Spirit of Christ that explains the claim that the Galatians were eyewitnesses to Jesus' crucifixion. In this connection, Giovanni states with his usual care that, and I quote, those scholars who have suggested a theatrical element behind these passages from Galatians are not wrong, as long as we do not think anachronistically of passion plays or dramatic reenactments of the Gospels. And he adds that, I'm quoting again, an element of performance is inherent in all cases of spiritual, uh, spirit possession, end quote. In the light of these considerations, I want to draw attention to one of Paul's terminological peculiarities, his language about putting on Christ. Perhaps the most famous example is Galatians 3.27, for everyone who has been baptized into Christ has put on Christ. Similar language is used in Romans and 1 Corinthians. The verb here, enduro, can mean to get into or even to dwell in, which meshes very well with Giovanni's overall treatment of possession. But I would like to suggest something different. The word's base meaning is to wear, as in wearing clothes. The very same letter where Paul describes baptism as putting on or wearing Christ, he also describes Christ as having been crucified before the very eyes of Paul's auditors. As Giovanni has shown, Paul is a man possessed by the spirit of Christ, and thus, if our cross-cultural parallels can be relied on, a man who performs Christ, indeed, performs Christ crucified. Under these circumstances, might we not dare to take literally Paul's language of dressing in Christ? Might we not dare to conclude that Paul's exhibition of himself in possessed form included props, such as a mask, distinctive clothing, or whatever it is that Paul means when he says that he bears the marks of Christ on his body? Obviously, this suggestion is more than a little speculative, and I have no idea how one would go about proving it. Nonetheless, I believe that such a scenario is supported by Giovanni's analysis and has at least the benefit of forcing us to think differently, dramatically differently, about who and what Paul and Pauline Christianity really was. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I want to also say thank you so much for this invitation to engage with your work, Giovanni. Um, Giovanni has produced an extremely, extremely stimulating book that combines anthropological research with close textual understanding of key New Testament passages that speak about spirit possession and exorcism. His aim is, quote, to initiate a process of decolonization between readings of possession and exorcism narratives, end quote. What makes Giovanni's book so stimulating is not only what it says about the ancient world, but what it says about our experience of the modern world. Giovanni carefully defamiliarizes readers of conventional understandings of key words such as spirit, daimon, possession, words that appear throughout the work in quotation marks. For me, some of the most stimulating points in the book were not specific exegetical ones that Giovanni makes about particular passages from the Gospels or from Paul, but rather the points that he makes 
about how we as academics intellectually frame ideas and the models that we uncritically use over and over again. The analytical templates that we as scholars use make the ancient world more palatable to us by constraining complex aspects of ancient life that the modern academy finds unpleasant. These universalist models extend post-enlightenment systems familiar to the modern Western world into the past and systematize the complexity of the ancient world by using frameworks that are foreign to it. In large part, it is modern Western scholars who uphold and maintain the illusory, div illusory divide between this world and the other world, and who labor to establish what Bruno Latour calls a purification, namely a systematic separation of different critical stances. Implicit in this division are assumptions about who inhabits these spaces. This world is a space ordered by humans and within which they enjoy agency, whereas the other world is a consolidated space for inert angels or demons and deities. While the spaces that we call this world and the other world are imagined to be dramatically different, we do well to allow them more fluidity than our usual analytical frameworks allow. Natural geographic features like mountain ranges or rivers often mark the boundaries between countries and regions in a way that differs from a solid wall that has been built brick by brick, insofar as they are porous and they allow for movement between spaces. The precise transition between one realm and another is either more gradual in the case of a mountain range like the Alps, or the boundary itself may be fluid in the case of a river like the Great Mississippi, which serves as some part of the border for 10 states. This permeability between this world and the other world is more compatible with the way individuals experience religion, highlighting the artificial nature of the division insisted by those in the modern academy who resist hybrid or mixed systems. Laura Felt describes this hybridized way of thinking about such experiences as being from both this world and the other world as a movement between worlds. She writes, quote, religious narrative does not encourage a resolution of tensions in the gap it opens between two worlds, a mundane everyday world and an extraordinary divine world. Instead, it encourages a fascination with the movement between the worlds, end quote. Foundational religious narratives like those examined by Giovanni from the Gospels and from Paul offer the opportunity to glimpse how ancient minds conceptualized this movement between the worlds as individuals negotiated identity in complex ways that go beyond the usual model favored by biblical scholars of a buffered self who exercises complete mastery and self-possession. The modern privileging of the agentic self has a long genealogy that Giovanni traces back to the early modern period. Using the work of Paul Christopher Johnson, Giovanni writes the following, and here I'm gonna actually read a kind of lengthy quote, but I think it's worth uh, repeating because I know not everybody has read uh, Giovanni's work. Uh, the use of possession in the ethnographic writing on the history of religions begins in earnest with the modern European encounter with possession among the peoples of West Africa. Associating possession with Africans enabled early modern European explorers and ethnographers to cast the peoples they encountered as defined by their inferior self, diminished by their lack of control, autonomy, and individual rationality. Thus, in the writing of European intellectuals as influential as Locke and Hobbes, the discourse of possession did become a strong underpinning for trajectories that did eventually lead to the ideological justification of racism, colonial domination, and given the dire implications of understanding possession as the surrendering of the ownership of one's own body and self, enslavement. And that quote comes from page 16 to 17. According to this model, practitioners of African and Afro-Atlantic religions who engaged in spirit possession were generally considered as not being in full possession of their, of their self, their selves, I guess I should say. The 17th century view has a long reach and also appears as recently as the 1960s in Gottfried Lienhardt's work, Divinity and Experience, 
the religion of the Dinka, where he concludes that the Dinka people from the South Sudan had no self. Such social scientific evaluations claim to have the air of objectivity, but when they are situated in the midst of cross-cultural studies and post-colonialism, they can be seen as provincializing the premise of the autonomous modern individual. Giovanni does well to draw our attention to Paul's frequent application of the language about slavery and enslavement to the early Christians. Such language was used by slave owners, of course, to justify and also reinforce the social evils of slavery in the modern world, an evil that continues to manifest itself in the pervasive racism that still plagues America today. It is notable just how often people today substitute the language of servanthood or serving when speaking about these passages, reflecting perhaps their disdain or rejection of the idea of slavery in general. But it is also just as likely, I think, that their self-understanding as agentic selves is simply deeply incompatible with the kind of subjectivity assumed in the ancient texts that are examined. Giovanni's study highlights the inadequacy of the idea of the agentic self and proposes that other models of the self and subjectivity are better able to express the phenomenon of the possessed self that we see in these ancient texts. Valuable here is his point that the self, especially in the case of spirit possession, is best understood as a continual and ongoing negotiation. Identity flexes from the state of being possessed by a spirit to the state of hosting a spirit in the state of possession. The idea of the self that is in flux or that is negotiating or renegotiating its identity within the larger framework of spirit possession offers a more capacious model for thinking about other types of experiences in which the self is not agentic, but afflicted by something that acts upon it. Like the lived experience of the self that is tormented by drug addiction, the self plagued by illness, the self who suffers from depression, the self that ebbs and flows as it slips into the deep and dark waters of dementia. Self-possession, Spirit possession presumes a worldview in which the self has acted upon from the outside, and it understands that the ability to be an agent or an actant is not consolidated within a certain type of elite human person, but rather agency is something that can be possessed by other things, and that such an experience can produce a real effect on an individual. In Giovanni's work, he relies heavily on the ethnographic studies of Michael Lambeck, whose fieldwork in the anthropology of religion examines the phenomenon of spirit possession in Madagascar and in Mayotte, an archipelago in the Indian Ocean between Madagascar and the coast of Mozambique. Giovanni does well to place these subaltern experiences of possession in conversation with the New Testament, especially with the modern Western study of these texts. This raises the following questions for me. Are we more willing to entertain the possibility of possession in these remote places in Madagascar and Mayotte precisely because of the otherness of their cultures? Does the distance between us here and the possessed in Mayotte somehow make it easier for us to imagine possession as something that happens over there, thereby allowing us to preserve our Western cultural assumptions and to remain unchanged by the kind of intellectual analysis that is being offered in this book? In other words, I wondered if, if Giovanni's selection of cross-cultural studies seemed to maybe artificially consolidate spirit possession experiences in faraway places or in long ago times. To be sure, Giovanni's book does open with a description of a modern day possession at the Shroud of Turin. While he uses this scenario to note how we are given a rare glimpse of the experiences of a possessed person in her own words, he doesn't return to offer further examples from the modern West. The event illustrates well how the ordinary everyday world and the supernatural world are permeable and overlapping realms, not just in antiquity, but also for many people and cultures today. While the, mo while the modern West may not be the locale for Lambeck's fieldwork, there are other anthropologists and religious studies scholars who have conducted ethnographic studies of spiritual or ecstatic sp experiences in the modern West, like Tanya Lorman's study of prayer from 2012, 
or her earlier work examining witchcraft in modern England entitled Persuasions of the Witch's Craft, which follows specific otherwise ordinary people who have an active and vibrant life in various witch cults in modern day England. Or Robert Orsi, who has written about spirit experiences between this world and the other world. Orsi's opening scene in his book, Between Heaven and Earth, paints a parallel between his mother with her fat stack of memorial cards of her deceased Jesuit friends and Mama Lola, a medium whom Orsi will meet later that evening. Orsi describes his mother laying out her memorial cards like a kind of celestial solitaire. Orsi's mother is disturbed by his plans to go out to a voodoo celebration in honor of Papa Getty, a spirit who will come to possess Mama Lola later that night, and who in fact delivers a special message to Orsi. Of course, the contrast is intended to be highly ironic since both women, Orsi's mother and Mama Lola, attest to similar phenomena embedded in very different cultural contexts in New York City. One, which uses the language of spirit possession, and the other, which we might describe as continuing bonds. Yet both underscore the diverse ways in which even in the modern West, individuals experience intersubjectivity with beings who are not of this world. Finally, the rich discussion that Giovanni offers raises one further observation for me, given our specific historical moment. He does well to remind us that the study of spirit possession today is based on close observation, but the study of the phenomenon in the ancient world relies on highly mediated texts, which are not a reality TV program. Giovanni is well aware of this. Like anthropological fieldwork, Giovanni's analysis, even of ancient texts, is always focused on examining the materiality of the experience of the spirit. In effect, the way in which the otherwise barely perceptible or invisible spirit is made real or made perceptible in the bodies of the Gerasene demoniac, in Jesus himself or in the body of Paul. A particular historical moment illustrates how difficult it is for some today to understand otherwise imperceptible realities, for example, like the COVID-19 virus as having agency in our world. Indirectly, Giovanni's provocative work speaks to our modern world's strong preference and orientation toward what is visible, what is tangible, and our reluctance to acknowledge that imperceptible realities can have real agency. In the introductory remarks in the, to the collection Spirit to Things, Paul Christopher Johnson offers an alternative way of imagining what it would be like to describe a spirit-infused world. He writes, quote, Presences pour into things and saturate my walk. Such formulations grant spirits a liquid form that is moving and fluid, but at least provisionally able to be contained or blended." End quote. The early Christian world that Giovanni describes in his provocative book is spirit-infused. It demands that we all become accustomed to thinking about how imperceptible realities like the COVID-19 virus or like the spirit could have agency and impact in this world. So too, the challenge is to imagine a world in which these spirits could be present all around us, even when they are not indwelling in human hosts and materially perceptible. So in closing, there are three aspects, just to sum up, of Giovanni's work that, in my view, are particularly provocative and challenging for modern scholars to think about. The first, what it says about the genealogy of the agentic self. Two, the pervasiveness of spirit experiences of possession in cross-cultural studies, which highlights the peculiar way we in the modern West imagine the idea of the self. And three, the way Giovanni's study forces us to reimagine the ancient world as spirit-infused, a world in which spirits are not artificially consolidated and inert in a remote, faraway place. That's it. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Giovanni. I'm going to invite all three of you, actually, if you wouldn't mind, to um, yeah come back to us, uh, because I think the next portion is best uh, is is easier uh, if you three are all visible. So, um, Giovanni, 
Um, why don't you first take a moment to respond to any portion of their remarks you wish? So thank you both Bill and Angela. This, this was great and uh, it's difficult to respond to everything because you offered so many interesting suggestions and also challenges. Uh, um, I want to highlight a couple of things uh, so that this may also, you know, generate more of a chat among us or with others. And I'm sorry if I leave out something, you, you'll remind me. Um, so, Bill, first, I, 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 I definitely, this is, you know, shows how interesting it is to do this because you have smarter people reading my work. And so they see things that I usually, that I would never think about. And this is great. I mean, the, the point of a fetish, the fetish and social change, I think is, is, is so great. And, uh, and, you know, could be enormously productive. Uh, I'll, I'll keep thinking about that. I, uh, the point of a mark as well, and, and the connection with Paul, I maybe one one definitely one one limitation of this book is that uh, that I acknowledge is that uh, and no problem acknowledging is that this treatment of of Jesus before Paul kind of follows the canonical order of the materials, but it's not it's not really historical and it, and in this case you know you have a good point it doesn't even make much sense it's definitely I see that connection. I mean, I don't know how much I want to push it to say Mark. Uh, Mark definitely shares this with Paul. I feel like the other Gospels um, are trying already to patch these up somehow. Though Luke in particular has a very different agenda. Luke is invested throughout the Gospel and Acts, uh, is invested in making the spirit less personal and kind of distancing it from the spirit is still very important for Luke, I and mean, hugely important, but it's more an impersonal thing and not certainly not the same as Christ. So there's a, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a pushback there. And your point about Galatians at the end, so uh, this, is, this is also something that Angela raised. I mean, it's true. I mean, what I see, one of the things that, you know, kind of came very evident to me while I was writing this book, which I never thought about before was, Exactly what Angela said, how constrained our disciplinary um, training is and how that's shaped by certain some fundamental assumptions that sometimes we don't, even, even if we come from a certain background, we assume then when we are training, trained and, and we don't, and it's difficult to question them. This, you know, doing this research for me was certainly helpful to rethink many of these things, many of these assumptions and Angela's name, some of them relationship to where possession is coming from as a genealogy uh, from, from, the, from modernity. But, you know, your point about Galatians and the props there, you know, this is a thing that should be natural for me. Like I'm a Catholic from Italy, right? And so we, you know, we do this kind of things are done all the time. But obviously, if you, when you step into biblical criticism or New Testament uh, scholarship, you know, these are not things you should do because it's, it's more, it's more a, a word that is informed by a, Protestant Lutheran yes. agenda, and so these things are, uh, and and uh, while they're natural, really. <laughs> and and uh, the final point, uh, one one little thing about Angela's very good observation concerning concerning the ethnographies I relied on in 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 writing this. There's no question that. Uh, this was very, this material was very helpful, but while reading a lot of ethnographic work, it also became very clear to me that they are shaped by their own interests, right? Ethnography, anthropology as a discipline is this, you know, heavy colonial past. And certainly, as you said, Angela, it becomes easier to see these things, uh, you know, in a place as far away than, than some, somewhere closer to us. And, uh, and in that sense, I think, you know, you see that a little bit of a struggle in terms of, you know, ethnographies of, not ethnographies of contemporary Europe, but traditional ethnographies of Europe do not have any, you, Europe seems to be the only place in the world in which there's no possession, you know, and, and you can see a, a funny case is because my wife works on uh, the southern tip, of, southern tip of Italy, uh, the southern tip of the boat, um, uh, as is, is kind of was, was already identified in the 
in the 17th century as the India, India in Europe, our own India, because it was considered a place where, you know, uh, Jesuit missionaries were sent there in that place to kind of convert to the people who were already Christian, but because their religiosity was not, and one of the manifestations of that was kind of a cult, or some sort of ritual or possession that people used to do over there. This has been studied a lot, but it's one of the unique cases where actually the European continent has been looked at in this way, but in this very marginal place too. So. It is a very good point and certainly something that it needs to be revised and uh, considered. Sorry, I'm spoken too long. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I have two questions from the, uh, from the audience, one joining us, one uh, who, um, the question actually came before the presentation, someone who knows your work. Uh, but, but maybe Angela and uh, Bill, you want to say anything in response before we open it up to uh, Q&A? Giovanni's uh, uh, response to my response was too ironic for me to, to uh, uh, yeah. Not competitive enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I suppose, um, I, I'm not even sure that this is worth blogging, but, but the, the observations about Luke in the spirit uh, interest me. Uh, and, and I would say one of the reasons that Luke is so transformative of uh, uh, the uh, view of spirit possession that, that may appear in his sources is precisely because it's so important. So I, I, I worry a little bit about positing too much discontinuity uh, as, as we move from, say, historical Jesus to whatever, Mark Q, to later uh, revisions of Mark and Q, like Matthew and Luke. Um, I, I think that they that our field has trained us to look for the discontinuities and and uh, at the expense and they're there for sure um but at the expense of of uh, glossing over the continuities yeah i no, absolutely no doubt yeah that's a, that's a very good corrective i want to be ironic again uh, sorry <laughs> but yeah but it, it 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 is definitely if you read acts those possession is happens regularly yeah. It's kind of very regulated in, in Acts. Yes. Right? You yes. Know, every time you, someone converts, you know, Pentecost in chapter yeah. two, and then a Cornelius, uh, as yeah. you know, every time that's, it's kind of an automatic sanction. It's, it's kind of becomes, it's definitely very important for Luke. Yeah. He needs to have it uh, at certain key point, but, uh, but regulated. Yeah, of course. <laughs> oh, I wanted to ask you too, uh, Giovanni, again, it's really stimulating book, and I really enjoyed uh, the discussion of Paul, you know, that you offer in the book. But really, my question is about some of the things that you didn't discuss, and just to hear your thoughts about why there are no exorcisms in John. You know, it seems like the Johannine tradition has so much there about what you're talking about, you know, first John, uh, you know, but even the Gospel of John, you know, uh, language about uh, the indwelling and the spirit. I just... I was sort of struck, I was convinced, you know, in some ways that yes, this is a sort of integral and um, uh, pervasive aspect of the earliest uh, experience of uh, Christ for these communities, but then why, why is there that silence? I, I don't think it, I don't think it's not there. On, on one hand, on the one hand, I don't want to uh, do what uh, I'm, I'm happy to see, to, 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 to see that Bill uh, has noted that I don't want to make possession the thing that solves everything in terms of yeah. the history of early Christianity. I think Bill said the skeleton key. I mean, I, I, I don't have that. that. That would be too much. But mm -hmm. on the other hand, I, I think it's, it's all over the place uh, and not necessarily the ground foundational element for everything, but it's, it's, it's almost everywhere. And it's certainly, I don't think he's not there in John, uh, but John is doing something. I actually, I'm writing an art, trying to write, to find time to write an article on this because this is kind of a nice spin off, Angela, as you're right. It's a nice spin off of this book uh, to, to go to all the places where I haven't visited with this possession, to like a lot of apocryphal acts and, and other materials would, would, should be here too. Uh, or the shepherd of Irma, like you, uh, like you mentioned before, um, 
for John, I think John, John has it. John, for instance, John has all this language continuously of, you know, abiding, yeah. you know, being in the, being in the, in, in the, in, in the famous uh, image parable of the vine, but also elsewhere, you know, that's key for the religious experience of John uh, as a foundational thing that, that connects the Christ followers, Christ believers to, to Christ. And, and I think that's actually the way John speaks about possession, this abiding, which is uh, uh, meneo and menein in Greek, uh, it's just translated with this old fashioned English word, but, but it means to be in, it's the same language of the being in Christ or being in the pneumati in, in, a, in, a, in a spirit that one finds in the, in the other gospels and, and in Paul. It's only inflected in that way because I think also in that I'm old fashioned, I think John has kind of uh, wants a cosmic solution for the exorcist. That's why it doesn't have stories because uh, in that, I think many exegetes are right in saying, you know, once a cosmic exorcism of, of cosmic proportions instead of. Mm -hmm. Can I jump in now? Um, I think it's time for us to bring in some, uh, some of the questions from the audience. Uh, so a question for all three of you. Um, if in fact, Giovanni, you're quite right that the sort of the conventions of scholarship have blinded us to the, um, the, the, the kind of ambivalence and ambiguity in spirit possession uh, in, in the New Testament. Um, I wonder two things. Uh, one is, how does that relate to the way um, other adjacent traditions think about spirit possession? And uh, this is a question that came uh, from the audiences, specifically in the Platonic tradition and the daimon, which is, uh, you know, uh, valued very differently. Um, and that's wrapped up in the transition from the daimon to the demon, <laughs> uh, in which um, uh, Judaism and Christianity have some uh, crucial part. But I, I, I want to tag on a, a, a version, of, a question of my own to that, which is, if we have missed this in the New Testament, as you have suggested, then where else do we see it in early Christianity? Because presumably, uh, second and third century Christian sources would not have those same, same ideological blinders. They would still be participating in a milieu in which spirit possession was something to be performed. So where do you see this tradition play out? I have my own uh, suspicion about where it might, but, but I, I think you, you three probably know that second and third century landscape much better than I. That's part of it. it. It was sort of with that in the back of my head that I made the comment about Luke. Um, I'm, I'm one of these people who dates uh, Luke Acts to the second century. And so it seems to me that we have in Luke Acts really good evidence for uh, a sort of developing institutionalizing tendency that, that is trying to make its own sense of a broad phenomenon spirit possession. There was, there's one other place um, that, that I uh, uh, can see this emerging in, in second and third centuries, and that is uh, in some of the Nekamati writings, and uh, particularly Sethian literature. Um, there, uh, when, when I read in Giovanni's book the discussion of tongues as language of angels, it immediately brought to mind some of the liturgical texts in uh, Sethian liturgical texts. Uh, in the Nakamati Library, which seem to envision people participating in liturgy uh, in a, a basically engaging in a kind of formalized version of tongues um, and experiencing mystical visions and and, and so forth. Uh, so I'd say Sethian Gnosticism of the second and third century. My answer is yes. Charlie, you have written a book on this about the <laughs> double. So <laughs> the Thomasine tradition is all is all permeated by this. I always say, you know, when you go down to the Mani Codex, uh, Mani case, I don't know if you were thinking about that when you said you had something in mind. But to me, that seems to be a trajectory in which that's uh, that that you know this kind of. Uh, not, not the possession in the, in the form you see that, I don't know, in, in, in Mark or, or in the exorcism of Jesus, but this kind of negotiating the presence of a spirit within the self and then constructing subjectivity through that. It's definitely, 
very much present there, as it is, I think, in, in all the others, platonizing or, or, or close to platonic traditions that one can find in, in, in the second century or third century. Angela, did you want to say anything to that or you want to uh, pass? I think in, in later traditions, what, one of the things that I think about with um, especially the Gospels or the Synoptics is the reference to Son of David or Solomonic exorcistic traditions, uh, you know, that you have all over the Second Temple period. And, you know, people really connect Solomon or that tradition of Solomon as an exorcist or as a kind of, um, you know, uh, spiritual virtuoso in later Solomonic pseudepigrapha like uh, the Odes of Solomon. But uh, there's some very interesting, you know, images, you know, just to think about those traditions that oftentimes, uh, I think Solomon, our tendency is to either ignore that connection, which was very old, you know, it's there in the uh, very, uh, in all of the early, you know, references to the Odes of Solomon, that Solomonic identification. Um, but we sort of neglect some of those uh, earlier exorcistic aspects of those traditions and maybe overlook some of those spiritual uh, prophetic dimensions of those later writings, you know, as a result. But, you know, Solomon, you know, Josephus describes Solomon's uh, exorcistic powers, you know, um, you know, so he was well known uh, as an exorcist in Testament of Solomon, even later, you know, also you know, speaks about some of those references. So. Yeah. It also occurs to me that there's a trope within, um, uh, and I can't remember uh, uh, who the author is, but there, there appears to be a trope in uh, Greek literature uh, in the first or second centuries about uh, exorcists coming from Syria or Judea. Um, so that may yeah, be Lucian, a Lu Lucian, Lucian has ah, it very was, Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I, Giovanni, I think you're quite right. It, it would be interesting to consider sort of Mani in this lineage or someone like that who's visited by the Sitsigos or so, whatnot. But in light of uh, what everyone was speaking, I was actually thinking about Egyptian monasticism, uh, which tends to regard, of course, the demons as malevolent forces that you have to hold at bay. But in, um, in the Origenian kind of version of Egyptian monasticism, of course, demons and angels are, are siblings. They are uh, on the spectrum of fallen minds, and specifically Evagrius has this idea that when you are beset by one demon, you actually solicit another demon to help push out the other demon. He calls it an advanced technique, driving a nail out with a nail. But um, it's kind of like spirit possession jujitsu. Uh, but at the very least, it means you are you're playing with uh, demons, uh, even if ultimately the aim is to kind of uh, keep get them out. Uh, uh, but but of course, you're also trying to solicit um, the indwelling of angels. Uh, so even if you make all the demons uh, m malevolent, you want to cast them out, you're also trying to essentially populate yourself with an angelic. Uh, so you, your subjectivity is plural uh, either way, I guess. Um, okay, here's a question from uh, our, uh, our, our very own Michael Tate uh, from Princeton, uh, who used, was a, as a fellow here at the center uh, last year. He says, Professor Batsana, I deeply appreciate your work. Thank you. In the spirit of daring to take the language of early Christianity literally, might we conceive of the history of Christianity as a quote unquote ghost story? And if so, do histories of the Holy Ghost that make this ghost a friendly ghost <laughs> cover over other scarier tellings of the ghost's haunting? No doubt. Yeah, so Michael, hi, and thank you for the question. Uh, yes, I think it's great. I think, yeah, I mean, it would be nice and it's fun to, it's definitely a good idea to see this. And I think this is actually an, an underappreciated aspect of, you know, the long trajectory of early Christianity, the kind of history of how people came to the Holy Spirit as a concept or Holy Ghost, and how that's for, I mean, it, in, in, in normal reconstruction, in, in, you know, mainstream reconstructions, you get this 
question coming up in the fourth century, like, you know, around the Trinity and what's the third person of the Trinity at the end of the fourth century. And it's kind of popping up almost, you know, as no one expecting it, you know, every, a lot of this reconstruction focus on the figure of Christ and Christology and Nicaea. Then you get to the, you know, issue of pneumatology as if from nowhere. But I think there, there should be an, there, there is space for enormous work to be made about, uh, you know, kind of filling up the gap between the first and second century where, you know, there are studies about, you know, the spirit in Acts and Luke, the spirit in, in the New Testament, but then nothing or nothing that well done for the intervening uh, centuries even. And, uh, and, you know, that, that's, that's definitely a trajectory that should be, should, should be re revised. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I, I, I have to say that I thought that was a great question too. Uh, and it reminded me of one of the things that I really, really liked about this book, which was the treatment of the Legion story. I have long felt that that is a deeply spooky story. <laughs> and I think that the way that Giovanni unpacked its implications um, uh, really underscores that we are, in fact, in this story dealing with a ghost story. And, and that's what I'm saying. Giovanni, could you pick up this question as to whether you think this prejudice against spirit possession, taking it seriously, extends to scholarship on the ancient Mediterranean more broadly? Or is this the peculiar legacy of uh, New Testament studies uh, overdetermined by Protestant categories, which by the way, Protestant categories aren't limited to the study of Christianity. I, how, how pervasive is the problem, I suppose? I think the problem is pervasive and, and I don't think Protestants have to be blamed only <laughs> to, to be fair here. Uh, but the, because the, the, the problem is more pervasive because I don't think it's only a problem with Protestant categories. That might have more of a reflection on biblical and New Testament studies, uh, as they were built in the 19th century through mostly Protestant scholars, uh, which is understandable. But actually, as Angela has shown, uh, you know, with reference to Paul Christopher Johnson's work, for instance, the problem, the bias goes much back further to actually European in general colonialism and, and, and the concerns there and, and the problems raising there. So that those are the category, the, there where you see the categorical, the, the, the birth of those categories. And that, so that can be seen also in the study of antiquity, Mediterranean antiquity more in general. I mean, when you asked before Charlie, the question about, you know, for instance, uh, you were mentioning the presence of daimonia, daimonia, in, in Platonic traditions, there too, I think there is a little bit of an hesitancy in speaking about possession for some of the theurgic things, for instance, which, you know, which would be otherwise, you know, the same thing happens, you know, encounter that a lot in, in Pauline scholarship right now, stoic influence on Paul is, is a great idea. Uh, and, and I think it explains a lot of things about Paul, but, but, but you know, the way in which stoicism itself is conceptualized it is as if this thing's, you know, there's pneuma everywhere in stoicism, right? right. It actually literally permeates everything, right. but uh, but uh, doesn't possess things. Yeah, that, that reminds me of some of the scholarship on uh, Socrates' own daimonion, and, and funded by a very different set of prejudices, I think, there. It's the sort of uh, ancient philosophy as a discipline wanting to uh, kind of uh, very wary of this idea that Socrates is actually speaking about an entity that is guiding him, even if only negatively. And so there too, there's a pressure to make that a kind of a Plato's irony or Socrates grand metaphor, um, even though the Platonic tradition itself uh, goes on to take that quite literally and, 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 and place that daimonion in a much richer um, or, or in its rich, uh, in its place in a rich kind of cosmos of beings. But and if you look at scholarship on the Apology and the Daimonion, it's, it's, it, they've stripped that down to, to, to be sort of a, a purely rational, sometimes it's just a rational conscience that, that's operating in Socrates, which I find completely unbelievable. Uh, you know, on this point with uh, 
this spirit possession being a neglected area, a kind of oversight uh, of New Testament scholarship. You could say also, um, just to backtrack a little bit, a similar thing with respect to the study of prayer, which, you know, for people who study early Judaism really didn't become a topic of study, a scholarly area of study until, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls and there were you know, you have some 20% of the manuscripts are actually prayer texts, uh, you know, hymns, prayers, incantations, all sorts of things. Uh, and, and so there's a kind of scholarly desire to focus on sort of intellectual, sort of reasonable topics. Um, and even in the case of prayer, which we would imagine to be ritual, you know, ritual uh, experiences, religious uh, texts, there's a long-standing tradition of reading them just strictly as liturgy, uh, as li uh, literary texts, you know, so you have that kind of tension uh, in other areas in, I would say, biblical studies where there's a kind of reluctance to maybe engage topics that, you know, I think are, just present themselves as um, more ritual texts or religious texts, so to speak, like possession, rituals for possession or incantations or apotropaic texts. You know, there's just not the kind of depth and scholarly uh, engagement as you would find in other types of texts. That's just, you know, kind of a observation. Well, we're approaching the hour, the uh, 215. I think that seems like a good, we've, we've already spilled over, but, but we had to, this was so rich. Um, Giovanni, do you have anything uh, you want to add before we conclude? No, I just want to thank you, Charlie, and the Center for hosting this, and Angela and Bill in particular for two wonderful uh, re re sets of remarks that I'm, I'm going to think about. Well, you beat me to it. I was going to thank Angela and Bill once again. Both of you really brought wonderful comments to bear on this book. And I want to thank you, Giovanni, for writing it. I'm going to hold it up one last time. Uh, those of you who have not followed the link to purchase your copy, it's there in the chat. It's in the chat uh, function. Um, so uh, those of you um, who are interested in these faculty book events uh, or the center's programming, you might want to register for a mailing list. So uh, future events come by. Come by uh, come to you by way of uh, your inbox um, and you can do that on our website but uh, once again thank you all and have a wonderful day